Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John O'Reilly. I'm based in Galway in the west of Ireland. I work remotely for a company called Neat up in Oslo, and it's a pleasure to be here in Turin talking to you today. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so just a tiny bit about myself, um, I've been working as a software engineer for about 30 years, or just over 30 years now, uh, working in the Android iOS ecosystem since about 2010. So the plan for today is uh, we're going to talk about um, the, the number of key factors that have contributed to the increasing convergence of native iOS and Android development. Um, first up, we're going to... Uh, talk about the languages themselves. This isn't necessarily something new, but it's an important element to that dynamic. Uh, even more impactful, though, are the changes that have happened over the last number of years in terms of frameworks like SwiftUI and Declarative UI with SwiftUI and Compose, and with structured concurrency capabilities that became available in um, uh, the la last year. Uh, also in the context of using Declarative UI frameworks, not something that um, is uh, I'm sorry, can I? Um, <laughs> there's something, something's wrong with my setup here, sorry. Okay, should I be able to see the presenter notes here? I don't see the presenter notes for some reason. Yeah, it should be, yeah. Um, the, the presenter notes aren't showing up there. Is that different? So normally the presenter notes will appear uh, here uh, when I'm doing play. It's because you, you have to extend the desktop, I guess. Uh, you don't have the mic. Just, oh, sorry, can you? Uh, I'm very sorry, it's uh, in English. It was set up that way for some reason. Sorry, one of these things that always works in practice, but uh, <laughs> never... Okay. never they changed, of course, the, the stuff over here. You have to, uh, it's okay. not mirror, but it should be. You need to stop mirroring, I guess. Yeah, but they, they switch the, the, the place where you do that. Uh, and yeah, yeah, it, actually, it's uh, in uh, the use as drop-down menu. Go back, I think it's use as. Just, just go back to Fudge. it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. Use as drop-down Okay. Stop mirroring, okay. So intuitive, uh, yeah. yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Th thank you very much. Sorry, sorry. Apologies for the. Uh... Okay. So, as the title suggests, we're going to talk today about a couple of key areas that I feel have contributed to the increasing convergence of native iOS and Android development. First up, we'll cover some examples of how similar the Swift and Kotlin languages are. This isn't necessarily something new, but it is, of course, an important element to this dynamic. But as important as that is, what is more impactful, I think, are the very similar approaches we now have on both iOS and Android for both UI development using SwiftUI and Compose, and also more recently, the fact that we now have much the same mechanisms for managing concurrency on both platforms. And just to also mention someone in the context of both platforms using declarative UI frameworks, that I think we've converged to a large degree on use of MVVM on both platforms, or at least a unidirectional data flow type variation of it. And we'll see some small examples of that later. Lastly, not something I'm going to talk about in any detail, but also interesting, I think, to note how similar Android and iOS devices have become and the closer alignment of UX patterns. So I'm assuming mostly iOS developers here, but just a quick poll. How many people are using SwiftUI? Okay, I expected quite a few. And how many people have tried the Swift concurrency new functionality? Great, so maybe about half the people. And lastly, clutching at straws maybe, but anyone here doing any Android development? Yay. <laughs> They're hiding in the corners. <laughs> okay, so just wanted to show it's at this point um, some of the key milestones that brought us to where we are today. Both platforms started growing in earnest around 2008, 2009. And at that point, and for a while after, we were, of course, developing apps using Java and Android and Objective-C and iOS. And these, by the way, just sorry, these were the devices at the time. This is an iPhone 3G. And this was the funky uh, G1, T-Mobile 3 one with a little pull-out keyboard. <laughs> um, so, oh, well, 
highlight, highlighting these, highlight, bringing these to highlight a few things, I suppose. One is, I mean, the keyboard, the screen on this looks tiny now, but I mean, at the time, it, you know, we, we sort of consider this to be sort of normal. But also just to sort of emphasize, obviously, how far devices have come since then and how much they've converged and how similar they are to each other. Um, so we fast forward to 2014. Swift is now supported in iOS and three years later Kotlin on Android. Languages, as we've mentioned, that are of course significantly more similar to each other than Java is to Objective-C. 2019 then was a key year for UI development on both platforms. Jetpack Compose was announced at Google I.O. that year. That wouldn't be formally released until 2021. Swift UI then was announced at WWDC and released later that year. And lastly, we saw the announcement of the Swift 5.5 concurrency functionality at WWDC 21. So just to give some brief additional context to some of these developments before we dive into the comparisons. This was an article written in April of 2019 by Jesse Wilson from Square, talking even at that point about how he saw Android and iOS development converging. He was primarily talking about similarities in the languages, but within two months of that article, we see the announcement of frameworks on both platforms that would have an even bigger impact on that convergence. First off, a few weeks later, we saw the announcement of Jetpack Compose at Google I.O. Then about a month after that, Swift UI was announced at WWDC. And in terms of my own interest in this area, I had at the time been developing a native iOS application, and as someone that hadn't been opening up Xcode that frequently, I always struggled to remember again how to set up storyboards, view controllers, table views, and so forth. I'd seen the announcement of Jetpack Compose at Google I.O., but to be honest, it was a little abstract at that stage. I didn't really appreciate what declarative UI was all about or the impact it would have on mobile development. I was watching WWDC then, saw the announcement of Switch UI. It was available in Xcode beta that evening, and in the earlier hours of the morning, I had my first very basic Switch UI app. And I finally appreciated what declarative UI offered and, the, and the, how intuitive it made UI development. Something down the road that would be also be many people's experience using Compose on Android for the first time. By the way, one interesting point worth noting here, I think, as well, is the different sequence in which declarative UI and structured concurrency capabilities became available on each platform. On iOS, we started with declarative UI, and then added structured concurrency, whereas it was the other way around for Android. And I think this has some implications for how the existing functionality has had to evolve on both platforms. Okay, so let's dive into some of the comparisons. Firstly, the languages themselves. Yeah, no problem, yeah. Uh, it should it? be already on. No testing? Yeah. Okay, hopefully that's better. <laughs> um, no problem. Okay, so let's dive into some of the comparisons. Firstly, the languages themselves. So I'm not going to do an exhaustive comparison of Kotlin and Swift. Rather, I'm going to use a number of examples to illustrate how they compare. I should mention at this point that a lot of the side project I work tends to be sort of Twitter-driven. <laughs> so I'm going to mo mostly use examples from various Swift iOS articles like this that I've seen people in the community tweet about. So John Sundell wrote this article recently on different ways of iterating over Swift collections. And I thought, of course, it would be interesting to see what the Kotlin equivalent would be. Um, so if we look at the first example from the article, uh, probably won't take people too long, but at a glance, can anyone spot which is Swift and which is Kotlin? Yeah, and, and if we add the array declaration in, it's a little clearer which is which. Differences in the use of parentheses, let versus val, print versus println, for example, but clearly very similar other than that. A few more from that article. And again, the key thing here is how, at a minimum, Kotlin is at least very readable to someone that knows Swift and vice versa, and probably wouldn't take a developer from either platform that long to figure out how to write the code for the other. And lastly, from John's article, we see some examples of iterating over maps. And I think we see even closer similarity, again, map declaration aside. Okay, lastly in this section, another recent article, this time from Sarun, talking about sorting Swift arrays. And again, we see the similarities. API is almost identical in the initial two examples, though a little difference in what reverse represents in Swift, and then a few differences in how we set up custom comparator, but again, easy to understand either approach. And by the way, we'll see some additional comparisons of the language in the next few sections where we talk about declarative UI and structured concurrency. Okay, we're getting to the comparisons that I think are the more impactful similarities we have today. Firstly, the use now of declarative UI frameworks on both platforms, Swift UI on iOS and Compose on Android. So it seems like most folks here are probably familiar with Swift UI, but just to level set somewhat. Uh, so a common way of explaining declarative UI is in terms of the what versus the how. With declarative UI, we declare what our UI should look like in a particular state, 
And state is very important in this context. Any changes in state cause the appropriate parts of our UI to be re-rendered or recomposed. Another interesting implication of this approach then is that it at least encourages use of MVVM on both platforms. And typically, as mentioned, unidirectional data flow variation of it. And as well as SwiftUI and Compose, it's also the approach used in the likes of React and Flutter. And as we mentioned earlier, SwiftUI was released in 2019 and Compose in 2021. So this was a tweet from Thomas uh, about GraphQL SwiftUI sample he created using the Apollo library. I'd been using Apollo in Kotlin multi-platform code, so I thought it would be interesting, with Thomas's blessing, uh, to create a Compose and SwiftUI version of this that consumed the shared code and also used the multi-platform version of the Apollo library. These are iOS and Android screenshots from the sample, and we're going to drill down and compare, for example, how a row in this list would be represented in SwiftUI and Compose. So at a glance, we firstly see that SwiftUI uses structs, of course, to represent UI elements like this, whereas Compose uses Kotlin functions. But if we ignore the outer, what you might call wrapping around the UI elements, I think we see more clearly how similar these are. Some differences, of course, like HStack, VStack in SwiftUI versus row column in Compose. We have async image in SwiftUI and image in Compose to display an image from a URL. There's text elements in both with some differences then in how styles, etc., are applied. But key thing again here is how closely the concepts align and how easy it's becoming for a developer to sort of translate the UI on one platform to the other. And hearing more and more stories of teams where this is happening, UI might be originally done in SwiftUI and then a composed version is done based on that and vice versa. Another example from one of the samples I have, this time illustrating use of Canvas in both SwiftUI and Compose. Uh, this particular sample is perhaps a little bit obscure. Um, it makes use of what's called a chip aid emulator and shared code. This was an instruction set used in arcade games of the past, the likes of Space, Space Invaders. Still, probably showing my age here. Um, it has the concept of a virtual CPU and a virtual display, for example. So what we want to do is display... What, so what we want to do is display, generate an array of data from the emulator code as it runs its program. And we need to show that in SwiftUI and Compose. So we're able to, to use, as I said, Canvas in both SwiftUI and Compose with, again, very similar code used for both. Here we're iterating over that virtual display data we're getting from the emulator as it runs its program, and then using Canvas APIs on both platforms to update the UI. Again, small differences in the API used, but again, fundamentally the same approach. And one more example from another sample I have, this time for the this fantasy Premier League app, again using SwiftUI and Compose. Again, we see the similarities in structure here, and in particularly, again, if we focus in on the UI elements, some differences in the APIs used and how styles, padding, etc., are managed, but much the same other than that. In general, if we think of our UI as a tree of components, then what we typically see is closer similarities for ones like this, but with some bigger differences then when we get to, say, screen-level uh, representation in terms of how, for example, navigation is, is managed. But still, conceptually, the same approach used. Lastly, in this section, I thought it was interesting to point out that not only do we now have support for widgets in both platforms, but we can, again, use the same declarative UI approach for developing them. Next up, concurrency. And more specifically, we're talking about the structured concurrency capabilities that we now have on both platforms. This is a really powerful capability that allows us to write async code in a way that's easy to read and allows a more deterministic structured approach to error handling cancellation, for example. Key enabler of this is the ability to have code that can be suspended at particular points and resumed later. And as we'll see in a moment, Swift supports this through things like tasks, async functions, and async sequence. And Kotlin similarly through coroutines, suspend functions, and flow. This approach, for example, allows executing async functions both sequentially and in parallel. I'm going to show some examples of both shortly, along with some examples of the use of async sequence and flow. And a very important aspect of this is how invocation of code like this can be tied into the UI lifecycle, thus allowing, for example, automatic cancellation when the view disappears. I'm, going to, I'm not going to dive too deeply into the concepts around this. Hopefully, folks saw Shai's really nice talk earlier that covers some of these topics in more detail. OK, so firstly, let's look at executing async functions sequentially using slightly adapted version of example from Paul Hudson's excellent series on Swift concurrency. Here we have three async functions, fetch weather history, calculate average temp, and upload, which we're invoking sequentially from process weather, which itself is an async function. Some of these functions would, for example, make a remote API request and have to wait for the response. Hopefully, you'll see already at this point how much more readable this approach is. And this is what the Kotlin equivalent is. 
We see here the use of suspend keyword in Kotlin versus async in Swift, both denoting a function in which suspension can occur. And also the fact that we explicitly use await in Swift where suspend functions can be called directly in the appropriate context in Kotlin. Looking then at some examples of how we would invoke async code like this, it can be invoked from a main function as shown here, marked again as async in Swift and suspend in Kotlin. We can also create a task in Swift, and similarly in Kotlin, create a coroutine from which it can be invoked. Where things get interesting then, I think, is how we can tie this into our UI lifecycle, along importantly with automatic cancellation when the UI is no longer shown. We use the task view modifier in Swift UI for this and launch effect in Compose, and we'll see another example of that later. Whereas the previous example showed how we can evoke async, fun async functions sequentially, uh, Donnie's article about use of async let and associated examples shows how to invoke tasks concurrently. And again, slightly modified version from the sample, and it shows how we can kick off a number of tasks that run concurrently and wait on them. And, this, and we'll see this in more detail in the next slides. And again, this is the Kotlin equivalent. And if we break it down a bit more, we again see use of async in Swift and suspend in Kotlin. Very similar mechanism then for invoking these async functions in parallel and waiting for them to return, using async let in Swift and async coroutine builder in Kotlin. In this case, we're going to load a list of movies and user info and wait for them to complete. And these requests, as I said, will execute in parallel. Finally, we kick off a number of other async tasks that again execute in parallel and again wait for them to complete. The other major component of the new Swift concurrency functionality is async sequence. This allows asynchronous iteration over a stream of values. And this is something that maps very closely to a Kotlin flow. This is a basic example adapted again from Paul's articles, use of async sequence in Swift, along then with example of use of Kotlin, uh, use flow in Kotlin. We use obviously for await in Swift, as Shai covered earlier, and collect in Kotlin to effectively do the same thing. And then also a few examples of the, some of the operators supported. Firstly, using map to convert each value to a separate case version. Again, we see the Swift and Kotlin versions. And similarly, then again, we use filter then, for example, to filter on a particular string. So as I was preparing this section of the talk, uh, and in particular looking at ways in which Swift async sequence operators compare to those supported by Kotlin flow, I'd read a few articles like this talking about how aspects have combined that were still missing from async sequence. And this is something that Shai also mentioned in the talk earlier. At that time, there was still a gap there that meant in some cases people still needed to rely on combine or libraries like async extensions that mimic some of the functionality it provided. So was of course interested a few days later in seeing Swift async algorithms package announced. And with this, we now effectively have, even though it's not exactly part of the core offering at this point, even closer mapping between the capabilities of Swift async sequence and Kotlin flow and the operators they support. And this is a few examples using some of the new operators included in that async algorithms package along with their Kotlin equivalent. Using new async method provided that by that package to convert a Swift array into an async sequence with as flow being used in Kotlin to achieve the same purpose. And as before, we use for await in Swift and we use collect in Kotlin. And using the first example here of the, the merge operator and then the zip operator here, and several other operators in common now as well. Just to finish off this section, I wanted to show one other example of, where, of how we're now talking about the same concepts on both platforms, using in many cases the same vocabulary. I'd watched a session at bottom right at Kotlin Conf in 2019, where they talked about how cancellation of core routines needed to be cooperative. I thought it was interesting then to see the structured concurrency talk at WWDC 21, talking about the same concept, talking about canceling tasks, and that's in the Swift case. I'm going to talk just very briefly about Kotlin multi-platform as it's something I think that can, can nicely complement some of the developments we've been discussing here, again, in the context of developing native applications and in relation to sharing non-UI code. Subtitle here, obviously, not the official one. <laughs> um, but phrasing like this to perhaps emphasize where this potentially fits in. I heard someone also say this has a capability to write share code that perhaps nobody likes to write. And, common example that people talk about often is likes of shared analytics, for example. And bringing it up here as well, as we see a small example of, this, uh, of how the similarities we've been discussing here make the consumption of Kotlin code uh, in, in, in Swift very seamless, along with async-related code as well. 
This is a quote from Kevin Galligan, who works for a company called Touch Lab in New York. They've been pioneers in the Kotlin multi-platform ecosystem, highlighting again the fundamental difference between cross-platform approaches where we try to share UI, and what I think is a more pragmatic approach where we share some non-UI logic across the platforms while still developing, very importantly, as native applications. And the key component of Kotlin multi-platform that's of interest to us here is Kotlin Native. It provides a capability to compile Kotlin code natively using, for example, LLVM on iOS. Typically, a framework is created from which it can be consumed directly in Xcode. And very importantly, we can access native APIs directly from the shared code if needed. The last point here is something I've been using in a few samples, which is this nice capability now to build a shared code as a Swift package and add that like any other library into Xcode. And just showing here how Kotlin and Swift types are mapped to each other when using Kotlin on the platform like this. I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but just to give a flavor. But also, and we've also seen some of these uh, in the, some of the comparisons that we've done in the talk already. Okay, we're going to finish up with a small example that illustrates again some of the, some of the areas we've been uh, comparing. This is based on another sample I have in GitHub called Bikeshare. Uh, this example includes broader functionality, but for illustration purposes here, we're going to focus in on showing a list of what are called bike stations for a particular bike network. In this case, one for the city of Galway, where I live. And this is what the high-level architecture looks like for an application like this. We're building native iOS and Android apps using Xcode for iOS and Android Studio for Android, using SwiftUI on iOS and Compose on Android and MVVM for both. We then, in this example, we have a shared repository which we're consuming in both platforms. And this is excerpt from that shared repository that we're going to use in the example. It pulls info for a particular bike network and exposes that as a Kotlin flow. Something we'll use directly in, Android, in the Android client, but we'll map to an async stream in our Swift iOS client. So firstly, this is what a view model might look like for, in this example. Typically, its purpose is as a container of observable state, changes to which then will cause the UI to be re-rendered. And as a sort of a conduit for actions we're taking from the UI, that would typically cause that state to be updated. Also can be used for transforming state we get from other parts of the code to something more suitable for the UI, though not doing that in this particular example. This pattern here for iOS is pretty common, I think, using a observable object protocol along with published property wrapper. By the way, uh, if the more observant of you will note, if you were at Shai's talk earlier, that I failed to leave in, that there should be a main actor added to that as well, by the way. <laughs> that was got excluded from the um, slide. Um, and we have poll network updates async function. And this uses the new four await mechanism of Swift, along with the capability that maps the Kotlin flow I showed in the previous slide to a Swift async stream. On Android, we're doing something very similar. In this case, we're using Kotlin flow collect instead of that four await that we use in Swift. And also triggering, when we get new data, update of some state that will cause Compose to re-render appropriate parts of the UI in a similar way to what we were doing in Swift as well. And this is what some of the Swift UI and Compose code looks like in this example. Again, we're using Swift struct for Swift UI, UI and Kotlin function for Compose, using list in one and lazy column in the other to iterate over the list of stations coming back from our view model in both cases. We use task view modifier in Swift UI to invoke the poll network updates async function from our view model and use launch effect in Compose to do effectively the same thing. And important to note that this will automatically get cancelled when our view disappears. And by the way, that cancellation also gets, get, gets propagated to the flow from the shared code as well, very importantly in both cases. Um, before we show the switch UI and compose code for the rows themselves, just a quick recap on what we're trying to show here. We have a row with a tinted image representing how many bikes are available, and then a column containing the name of the station and availability info. This is what the Swift UI code looks like for that. There's a lot to unpack here. We'll, we'll show the Compose equivalent next and then show a trimmed down version of both just to illustrate the comparisons. But here we can hopefully see general structure with an image showing the tinted icon, color based on the number of free bikes, and then HDAC text elements, etc. And this is, by the way, is from a sample in GitHub if people want to look at this in any more detail later. And this is the Compose equivalent. Don't worry again about the details too much here. We'll, we'll, we'll do a comparison in the next slide in a sort of pared down version. But hopefully, again, you'll see the same structure here as well. And, and OK, and then this is the pared down version side by side. And again, hopefully, we can see how the UI elements map very closely to each other. HStack to, to row, VStack to column, image, spacer, and text elements in both. Some API differences, of course. Some differences, as mentioned before, in how styles, padding, etc. are applied. 
Okay, so that was somewhat of a whirlwind tour of some of the areas I feel have contributed to the convergence of native iOS and Android development. And just to recap, there are of course many different permutations in how mobile development teams are organized depending on the company, the size of the project, but we at least, I think, have more possibilities now for people working on both platforms and becoming more general mobile developers. We've seen similarities in the languages, but even more important is the common approach we now have to both UI development and structured concurrency. And complementing that, I think, is the possibility of using Kotlin multi-platform for sharing some of the, the boring non-UI code on both platforms. Thank you.